pharmaceutical companies that uh, uh, put out these specific drugs. Um, but we do expect that negotiations will drive prices significantly lower um, as they have done for VA and DOD. And just to, as a reminder, uh, VA and DOD have been uh, negotiating drug prices for decades, and uh, pharmaceutical companies have not successfully sued them. In fact, they all stay on the formulary. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Again. Great. It was so much fun the first time. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, very quickly, uh, you all, as you know, going to hear from the FEMA administrator uh, who's here with us uh, to, to my right here. Um, and as you all know, at the president's direction, uh, has been leading, FEMA has been leading a whole of government uh, effort to prepare and respond to, the, to Hurricane uh, Idalia. Yesterday, the president approved an emergency declaration. Uh, and since then, hundreds of FEMA personnel have pre-deployed ahead of Idalia making landfall in Florida. Uh, and with that, I know that you're coming back, coming from uh, the Oval Office. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Kareen, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I know it hasn't been very long since I have been up here briefing all of you, but I think that this really is indicative of the pace of the major disasters that we are seeing across the nation. And the reality is we are just now approaching peak hurricane season. In addition to responding to the current storms, as well as other incidents, we have to remain focused on making sure that we are also preparing people across the nation for these types of extreme weather events. Um, I did just come from the Oval Office where I briefed the president on the trajectory of Hurricane Idalia and what the impacts are projected to be. And I wanna just give a quick update on the preparations that we are making uh, in um, response or in preparation for the response in Florida, as well as other states that are in the path of Hurricane Idalia. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to speak with Governor DeSantis. I also had an opportunity to connect with South Carolina Governor McMaster and Georgia Governor Kemp to help understand um, what their concerns were and to identify any unmet needs that they may foresee. Um, and we'll remain in close contact with all of them in the hours and the days to come as Hurricane Idalia, Idalia makes landfall and moves across these states. Uh, as the president said to Governor DeSantis in his own conversations yesterday, FEMA and the entire federal family are activated to support the people of Florida. The president also quickly approved an emergency declaration in advance of the storm in Florida turning on the many tools that are available at my disposal to provide the governor any support or resources he may need in advance of landfall and then after. This allows me to pre-stage people, equipment, and resources in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and I have done just that. We have pre-positioned uh, different types of resources across all three states to include several incident management assistance teams, our urban search and rescue teams, our disaster survivor assistance teams, and they are all ready to pivot to the most impacted areas immediately after the storm passes. We also have warehouses filled with commodities like food, water, blankets, and medical supplies that are re uh, ready to rapidly move into the impacted area at the state's request. But we are not in this alone. We have an entire federal family that is postured to support. Our National Response Coordination Center here in Washington, D.C. is fully activated, and this means that there are several hundred staff from across the federal family that are working together to support any requests for federal assistance. Uh, we have our partners from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who are pre-positioned to support any power restoration needs. Uh, Health and Human Services is assisting with evacuations from hospitals and assisted living centers. And the Red Cross has 50,000 meals to support the immediate needs as requested and has pre-staged shelter support to supplement the 19 shelters that are already open by the state. And this is a really important point that I wanna talk about next. It's on preparedness. And again, I really ask for all of your help to help me ensure the people in the storm's path get this message. While we are engaged uh, with our states to prepare for the path of this storm, it's critical that the people that are in the path of this storm are also prepared. And I know that the people of Florida are no stranger to storms, and I encourage all Floridians to take this storm seriously. 
This storm is very strong and is expected to strengthen to a major hurricane by the time it makes landfall due to high surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. This means heavy winds, high winds, heavy rain, and a forecasted 12-foot storm surge in some of the areas along the western coast. This storm surge, this is one of the highest risk parts of a hurricane and is especially problematic along the west coast of Florida due to the underwater geography. The coastal shelf gets shallow very quickly, which increases the amount of the storm surge, putting more people at risk. Very few people can survive being in the path of major storm surge, and this storm will be deadly if we don't get out of harm's way and take it seriously. So I ask all Floridians to be vigilant and heed the warnings of your local officials. Have a plan to communicate with your family and your loved ones. Charge your cell phones, your batteries, any devices that you may have, and ensure that you are receiving emergency alerts. And most important, please listen to the warnings of local officials. If they tell you to evacuate, please do so immediately. And remember, you don't have to evacuate far. If you are in a storm surge warning area, it could mean just traveling 10 or 20 miles to get out of the most significant um, impact areas. It does not mean having to travel hundreds of miles to get out of the storm's path. And finally, we are all in this together. I ask that you check on your neighbors, especially those who are older adults, people living with disabilities, or may need additional assistance. Um, but before I close, I want to provide an update on another topic that has been widely reported in recent days and asked by many of you, uh, FEMA's Disaster Relief Fund, which as of this morning has a balance of $3.4 billion. So today, I am directing the implementation of immediate needs funding. This means that FEMA will prioritize available funding for critical response efforts to Edalia, the Maui fires, and any other extreme weather events that may come our way without interruption, while continuing to meet the immediate needs of survivors through the remaining weeks of the fiscal year. I want to repeat, we are prioritizing funding for Edalia, for the Maui fires, and any other extreme weather events that are coming our way without interruption. And I want to stress, that while immediate needs funding will ensure we can continue to respond to disasters, it is not a permanent solution. Congress must work with us on the supplemental request that the administration has made on behalf of FEMA. And you are going to hear more from me on that soon. My primary responsibility at FEMA is to ensure that we are always postured to respond to any disaster and to provide the life-saving and life-sustaining support when needed. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Uh, can you relate what your conversation, what you talked about with Governor DeSantis, and add any details about what coordination you're undertaking with Florida officials? Uh, yes, when I spoke with Governor DeSantis yesterday, my, my main question is always, what are your main concerns? What are the areas that you have the greatest concern about? And do you have any unmet needs or resources that we can bring in? He shared with me what his posture at the state is going to be and where he has some great concerns. And we are working and embedded with his staff. And I assured him that we have teams working side by side with our colleagues, our emergency management colleagues there at the State Emergency Operations Center to be able to quickly respond as needed. Following up real quick, I mean, what were those concerns that he had at that time? He shared with me the concern, again, about people taking this seriously and being able to evacuate as a result of the storm surge. Uh, he has concerns about uh, the vulnerable populations, right, and making sure that we are providing any assistance we can uh, to help them get out of harm's way. Um, you mentioned the supplemental request after getting a fuller idea of what has happened in Hawaii and with the storm threatening uh, you know, a severe impact. Do you anticipate raising the level of that supplemental request as you start to negotiate it with Congress? Right now, the supplemental request that we have put in is $12 billion, and that will be a bridge to get us through the end of the fiscal year. Uh, if we continue to see more storms, we're going to uh, continuously monitor very closely the health of the Disaster Relief Fund to determine what more may be needed. But right now, as the situation stands, 
the supplemental request will get us through the end of this fiscal year. In some places, there is a frustration with institutions and authorities. We've seen that in the wake of some other disasters. Do you have concern about people taking the warnings from public officials, acting on them? And when we saw with Hurricane Ian, there was a plan, again, the forecast indicated it was going in one place, it went uh, farther south, mm -hmm. and some people did not get out of the way. So my question is, given what we don't know, are you concerned that there is any um, wariness, mistrust, or uh, fatigue about listening to officials in times of crisis like this? I think the important thing uh, to look at, and when we look at Hurricane Ian, is it's not just the path of the hurricane that we need to be concerned about. We have to be communicating what the entire risk is, and the significant risk and the, the, the highest risk for uh, loss of life is storm surge. And that storm surge right now shows impacts all along the western coast. And so I encourage people, and I really appreciate your help in getting that message out that it's not just the path of the storm and it will continue to change, but look at all of the risks that are associated with the storm, storm surge being the most life-threatening, not just where the path is going to go or where the eye of the storm is going to make landfall. And in terms of the credibility of authorities, do you sense that there is any erosion of that at a time when you're trying to get that message out? I don't have any indications that there are. I think that what we are seeing right now in Florida is people are heeding their advice of local officials and people are moving out of harm's way. Um, thank you. Um, when, I'm going to go back to Hurricane Ian. When Hurricane Ian hit, you had many communities of color. You also had poor communities complaining that they were not prioritized um, during this time. And so they didn't get necessary um, the relief that they wanted, and they felt like they were kind of put on the, on the back burner. Many of these areas are in places that are more physically vulnerable. What is your message to those who have that concern um, that there may be a, a repeat in their community? Yeah, so during Hurricane Ian, uh, we had a large amount of people that were impacted by that storm, and we had teams of personnel that went out into communities across the state. And as we heard of stories of maybe pockets of people that we had missed, we immediately sent our teams out into those areas to ensure that they were getting registered for assistance and we were bringing um, all of the resources that are available. And so what I would say is uh, if you hear about uh, groups of individuals in parts of the state that after the storm passes are in of need and they aren't getting that, let me know. I will send my teams out to those areas to make sure that they're getting all of the assistance that they're eligible for and that they need. John. Thanks a lot. Uh, FEMA, of course, has been dealing with the aftermath of the wildfires in Maui, and now you're preparing for a very powerful hurricane hitting Florida's southwest coast. To what extent is FEMA overextended or stretched too thin in dealing with these two natural disasters? Uh, we are certainly postured and have the staff that are available to support multiple large events at the same time. Uh, we do have several open recovery disasters that we can pull some personnel from if we needed to extend or increase the amount of personnel we have. Uh, we also have a very layered approach, right? We can also reach out into all members of the Department of Homeland Security through what we call the surge capacity force for individuals that have volunteered to support during a disaster. And so I'm confident right now that with these two storms that we're currently dealing with in Maui and this one, or even another one to come, that we have enough personnel to go in and support these immediate life-saving efforts. One last question, Alex. Um, yeah, I, you mentioned just extreme weather that we've seen all all summer from you know Hawaii storms in uh, Southern California is this is this in your view the new normal just summers where we're seeing these kinds of events more frequently and maybe more intense events than before you know what I can say is that we don't have a typical operational season like we've had in the past uh, we would normally prepare our staff to be on extra alert during the peak of hurricane season, which is where we find ourselves right now. But our operational tempo has been year round. We started with atmospheric rivers in California in January, uh, extreme tornadoes in the spring to the wildfires, and now we are in peak hurricane season. Uh, and we have had an unprecedented number of disaster requests from governors because of the extreme weather that they're experiencing. This is our new normal. This is the operational tempo that we find ourselves in. And we have to continue to invest in mitigation and resilience to help these communities reduce the impact from these storms so we don't have such complicated recoveries afterward.
Okay, we have about 10 minutes before we have to move for the president's event. Chris, you want to? Uh, Reverend Sharpton said he wanted to hold a summit on hate and hate crimes in Jacksonville, and he was going to invite the president and vice president to attend. Uh, what was the response to that, the, the RSVP? So I believe uh, the date for the summit is still being determined. Um, as you know, and you've heard this from the president over the past couple of years, uh, talking about the fact that we are in the battle for the soul of, of our nation. Uh, matter of fact, that's one of the reasons he decided uh, to, to run back in 2019. So we'll continue to work with the civil rights leaders, uh, including uh, Reverend Sharpton, uh, to, to, to combat the hate. As you know, he uh, convened the civil rights leaders yesterday to thank them for the work that they have been doing uh, and how critical it is uh, right now for, uh, for us to continue uh, to, to fight for this battle. And one more quick thing. Uh, Kim Jong-un uh, called the leaders of the United States, South Korea, and Japan gang bosses and has said his military will be prepared uh, for action during the exercises that are underway. Um, any response to those those comments? So this is the first time I've heard those comments. Uh, obviously, um, uh, we have said many times, uh, you know, uh, the lines of communication with the DPRK remains open. Uh, that is something that we are certainly open uh, and willing to have. Uh, I just don't have anything to say specifically about about those comments. Go ahead. Uh, and another foreign matter, the uh, video of Paul Whelan that surfaced today. How does the White House assess it? So U.S. officials have uh, have spoken with Paul with Paul uh, within the last several months. I think, as you all know that, uh, but it was uh, reassuring uh, to see that he remains, and this is to use his brother's words, unbowed. Uh, Paul continues to show tremendous courage. Uh, that does not uh, change that uh, his cir circumstances are truly uh, unacceptable, and we will continue to, to be very clear about that. Uh, Russia should release him immediately, and uh, and that is something that. Again, we have been very consistent about. Thank you. For me. A couple of foreign policy questions. Uh, the Kremlin, as you're aware, earlier today said um, Putin will not attend uh, Prigozhin's funeral. And we're just wondering if there is an update on whether the U.S. thinks Putin is behind uh, the Prigozhin plane crash. So I, I can't speak to the, uh, President Putin attending or not. That's certainly for him to. To speak to, I'm not going to speak about that from here, but I don't have any a new assessment for you. But it seems uh, pretty evident what happened here. Uh, that, uh, as as the president said that, said this recently, I believe as early as last week, that and I quote: "There's not much that happens in Russia that Putin is not behind." Uh, and if it's uh, if this is what it seems uh, to be, this this what is uh, certainly was not uh, just predictable, but it was predictable or, or predicted, if I should I should say. Uh, we all we all know that the Kremlin has a long history of killing its opponents. Uh, that is the history of, of the Kremlin. And if we take a step back, if you look back for a second, all of this uh, happened because of dysfunction inside Russia. A, a Russian warlord himself, a cold-blooded killer, a cold-blooded murderer, uh, became so frustrated by the way that the Russian government was uh, waging its unprovoked war against Ukraine. Uh, that he criticized Russia's uh, f failing policies. You heard that directly from him. And so uh, he called out the, war the war's needlessness uh, and marched on Moscow before, before reaching a deal with Mr. Putin. He made that very, we saw that, you all covered it for, for multiple hours. Uh, and so now two months later after he, he struck that deal, he's been killed. So, um, you know, it's very clear. The, uh, it's pretty evident what happened here. Don't have anything else to say. We have an assessment from the administration. I mean, I just said it's very clear of what happened here. There's new assessment. It is, it is very clear. It is very clear. I just laid it out. I don't have any new assessment for you on this. One on China. Um, Secretary Raimondo's comments earlier today that U.S. companies have complained to her uh, that China has become, quote, uninvestable. Um, is that increasingly how this administration is thinking about China when it comes to U.S. companies investing there? Or was that really sort of an off-the-cuff, undiplomatic Remark. I'm not going to go beyond what the secretary said. She's there. She's the secretary of commerce. Obviously, uh, she works with the business businesses ac uh, across the country on a regular basis. I'm just not going to go beyond what she stated. Okay, so. uh, just to follow up on that, on your last answer, understand the context is clear there, but is the administration concluding that Putin was behind uh, just, the death I, of Prigozhin? It, it is very clear. I literally just laid out sure, what the Kremlin, wait, I just literally laid out 
what the Kremlin um, history has been. I don't have any new assessment. I'm just going to leave it to the words that I just gave you. Okay, so the administration has no conclusion at, at I, this point. I, I just laid out what, uh, what uh, the history of the Kremlin, what Mr. Putin tends to do. I just laid that out. So it is very, it's very clear what happened here. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Uh, going back to Paul Whelan, does, does the U.S. have any uh, idea when that video was filmed? I've seen that it was filmed in May, but do you, do you think that it was actually filmed in May or is it older? So I don't, I don't have any, uh, any additional, um, kind of any additional uh, uh, comments to the video. Uh, like I said, I, I clearly quoted uh, his brother and how he said he seemed unbowed and how courageous Paul has been, uh, especially over the last several months and how we have been in touch with him. I just don't have anything uh, to say uh, to uh, specifically to the video. Uh, tomorrow the president's going to get the briefing on the Maui wildfires. It, it, will that also turn into a briefing on hurricane latest? Uh, so, just a couple of things on, well, um, so as you just stated, the president tomorrow is going to uh, convene the cab his cabinet and uh, agency officials who are involved in the administration's whole of government response that we have seen in the recovery efforts uh, on Maui uh, in Hawaii. And uh, so he called this meeting, obviously, to get the, his administration's ongoing efforts on the ground and to work on and the work underway to uh, to support the people of Maui. C clearly, he'll also get an update on uh, the current hurricane that we all, all are keeping an eye on, Hurricane Idalia. Uh, and so that'll be part of the conversation, obviously, uh, tomorrow as well. Thanks, Greg. Uh, the president yesterday told me that he believed that the victims of, uh, sorry, the families of two out of the three victims of the Jacksonville shooting might be open to receiving a call from him. Has he reached out yet? Has he spoken with them yet? So I don't have any any calls to uh, to lay out for you at this time or or to share. Um, and then Congressman uh, Scalise uh, announced today that he's been diagnosed with a form of cancer. Do you guys have any reaction to that, and is, does the president plan to reach out to him? Well, obviously, that's devastating news. Um, uh, our, uh, our hearts and prayers go out to, to the congressman and his family. Uh, clearly, he's gone through a lot over the past uh, couple of years. I, I don't have a call to, uh, to lay out or to, to announce at this time, uh, but uh, that is uh, very sad news, and clearly we are hoping for a speedy recovery for him. Um, any updates on if the president's traveling to Jacksonville to meet with family and victims? No travel on to And then on the um, drug crisis announcement, um, how is the president man planning to message this? Do we expect travel uh, in the next couple weeks talking about this specifically? Um, how is he planning to take this message to, to voters? Well, you're going to hear from the president in 20 minutes uh, to talk specifically about this uh, uh, about this new uh, announcement on the the, the, 10, the first 10 drugs. Uh, look, this is an important important announcement when we're talking about. Uh, uh, when we're talking about Medicare being able to negotiate, we're laying out these 10 drugs. Uh, this is something, as, as Nira was saying when she was here moments ago, that uh, folks have been trying to do for 33 years, for decades. And this is a president that's been able to do that via, uh, obviously, a provision through the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which I may add was only voted by Democrats. This is something that we uh, wanted to make sure that we were able to do, lower costs, lower health care costs for Americans across the country. So it is an, an important, I think, an important day, important uh, um, beginning, if you will, of uh, how we're going to move forward uh, with the Inflation Reduction as it relates to the uh, Medicare being able to negotiate. So you're going to hear from the President. Obviously, the President travels across the country uh, pretty regularly to talk about invest in how he's investing in America, how he's lowering costs for Americans. That is one of the, as he speaks about binomics, lowering costs for Americans uh, is clearly one of, uh, uh, one of his top priorities. So you'll continue to hear from the President about this particular issue and other ways that he, uh, that uh, binomics is working for American families and the economy as well. Yeah, Justin. Thanks, Corinne. Um, President Putin said that he was going to go to China in uh, October, I believe. Uh, obviously, one of his first trips uh, recently. Do you guys have any reaction? And, and is there any concern that this might, in some way, suggest that China and Russia are, are growing closer or growing closer on uh, Ukraine specifically? So look, I look. I, I'm not going to uh, get ahead of uh, uh, potential travel that another country is going to do uh, with uh, with with another country. So I'm not going to get ahead of that. Uh, we've been very clear about Ukraine. Our allies have been, our partners. The president has been able to bring uh, together uh, more than 50 countries to to uh, to help Ukraine uh, as they fight in a in in 
as we've seen in a very brave way for their freedom, for their democracy, and that's something that the president's going to continue to do, as I mentioned at the top, uh, as uh, as long as it takes. I'm just not going to get ahead of, of a potential meeting that uh, Putin and uh, President Xi may have. And then just schedule-wise, I, I think you were asked about Philadelphia yesterday. I was wondering if you have an update on that or on Labor Day, uh, if the president will be in Rehoboth or somewhere else. Yeah, so don't have any update on uh, on Philadelphia or Labor Day, but certainly we will share uh, we'll share any uh, potential travel that the president may have. Go ahead. Thank you. I have a question about Guatemala, but first on the meeting uh, this afternoon with President Chavez of Costa Rica, he has uh, expressed the interest of joining uh, the North American Trade Pact between the United States, Mexico, and Canada, the USMCA. Um, I was curious to know if that's something that the United States would support. So I'm not going to get ahead of uh, the discussion that they might have today, so I want to be really careful as that's going to happen in, uh, later today. Uh, we're going to have a readout uh, after the uh, after the meeting concludes. I will say this, that um, President Biden, Biden values uh, Costa Rica's close collaboration uh, on building out of America's partnership uh, for economic prosperity. So the two leaders certainly are going to discuss uh, how they can continue to work together to strengthen our economic ties and inclusive and resilient economies, within, which includes developing a resilient regional uh, semiconductor supply chain. So obviously that will be part of the conversation. I'm just not going to get into any specifics uh, um, on the, your question about US, U, USMCA. Uh, again, we'll have a readout uh, once the once the conversation concludes or the highlight concludes. Thank you. And on Guatemala, do you have any reaction to the decision that the Electoral Registry took yesterday to suspend the political party of the president-elect, uh, the seat movement? So we've congratulated Are Valo on his election as the next president of Guatemala, as confirmed by the certified uh, vote results. The United States remains deeply concerned with continued actions uh, by those who seek to undermine Guatemala's democracy. Uh, these efforts undercut the clear will of the Guatemalan people. Uh, so we stand with our partners in the international community with the Guatemalan people uh, against these unacceptable, uh, unacceptable efforts. But obviously, we congratulate uh, uh, the, new, the new elected president. Green, um, question on the big election topic, transgender rights. Former Governor Nikki Haley and presidential candidate says, quote, the idea that we have biological boys playing in girls' sports, it is the women's issue of our time. Does the president agree that this is a women's rights issue? So we've talked about this many times. This is the Title IX uh, specifically. Uh, look, um, and again, we've talked about this multiple times. It's a complicated issue, and there are a wide range of views on this. Uh, the Department of Education proposed a rule, as you know, uh, that gives schools the flexibility to establish their own uh, athletics uh, policies. And so while establishing uh, guardrails, right, to, to prevent discrimination against transgender kids, and that is something that is in incredibly important uh, uh, that the president wants to make sure that we also uh, do that as well. So I'm just not going to get ahead of that. As I said, there's a proposed rule uh, uh, for and uh, Title IX, uh, on Title IX, uh, that the Department of Education has laid out, so I'm just not going to get ahead of that as it relates to the Department of Education. Daughters, does he care that girls are allowed to compete in sports without I just, fear I, of injury? I just, does he think it's fair for girls to have to compete against biological males? I just answered the question. It is a complicated issue. It is truly a complicated issue with a wide range of views, a wide range of views. There is no yes or no answer to this. It is complicated. There's a rule that the Department of Education has put forward, uh, and we're going to let that that process move forward. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, again, uh, we want to make sure that uh, while we establish guardrails with this rule, uh, that we also prevent discrimination as well against transgender kids. But again, a complicated issue with a wide range of views, and we respect that. Okay. Thank you so much. I have a Latin America question and then an Asia question, starting with Latin America and Costa Rica. Uh, the U.S. and Costa Rica signed a migration agreement, I think, in June. Uh, just wondering if it's worked, if it's slowing the flow of migrants to the southern border of the United States, and what are the legal pathways for people who might be waiting in Costa Rica uh, and trying to claim asylum in the U.S.? So look, um, I, I, I talked about how they were part of the uh, signing of the LA uh, declaration that we did uh, just last year, which is they've been a partner in the region. 
uh, with us, and so we, we uh, certainly appreciate uh, that partnership and the collaboration uh, that uh, we've had with Costa Rica. I don't have any updates on the specific uh, migration or any data to share uh, with you at this time, but certainly uh, Costa Rica has been a partner uh, uh, with us as it relates to regional migration, uh, and so we appreciate their partnership. They're going to have a conversation. They're going to check in, as you know, in a couple of hours, and we certainly will have a readout on that. Moving on to Asia, why does President Biden believe it's a better use of his time to go to Vietnam instead of to the ASEAN summit in, in Indonesia, which he's sending the vice president to? Yeah, so look, um, as it relates to Vietnam and our relationships, look, since day one, uh, we focused on rebuilding, right? The president has been very clear on rebuilding and investing in our allies. And that is something that the president takes really uh, seriously, not just our allies, but our partners uh, throughout the world and especially in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and you saw that very recently, right, as we were, as uh, uh, as he had the trilateral in, in uh, um, uh, very recently at Camp David. So as the United States looks to deepen our ties with the region, uh, Vietnam is a key partner. Uh, in doing that. So the deliverables that uh, will be announced as part of this visit will reflect both the depth and the and the uh, the breadth of that relationship that we are that the president certainly takes very uh, seriously. The visit uh, will be a culmination of shared journey of peace and reconciliation, as our two countries look forward to facing the future as our partners together as it relates to ASEAN. Look. Um, he has tremendous respect for ASEAN. He has tremendous respect and for, for ASEAN and has uh, and was honored to participate in the three U.S. ASEAN summits, including hosting an unprecedented U.S. ASEAN leaders some, uh, meeting right here at the White House, as you know. And, uh, you know, he had the opportunity to demonstrate his personal support for ASEAN, uh, uh, certainly. Look, the vice president is deeply committed uh, to uh, to the Southeast Asia, to Southeast Asia, and also ASEAN, and so uh, we will be uh, will be uh, her third trip in the region, and uh, and so we we believe having uh, the vice president represent uh, the president as they are partners in this is also incredibly important, and you can see from the last two years the president's uh, commitment to ASEAN. Okay. Um, during the president's first year in, in office, he directed um, nine agencies across the federal government to um, create the equity action plans. Mm -hmm. um, he also gave them uh, to, to address discrimination in various in, in communities. But he also directed them to, to submit those plans in September um, to the White House um, Steering Committee on Equity. So. Can we expect anything toward the beginning of the month in that? Will those plans be released in the update that you have? So it's a very good question. As you, as you just stated, uh, when the president walked into this administration, he wanted to make sure at the federal level we were dealing with an issue uh, that was a crisis across the country, which is dealing with racial inequality. And uh, he wanted to do what he can from the federal government, obviously asking uh, the different agencies to figure out a way how do we make sure that there is equity in the agencies on the federal level. Uh, you're right. We're supposed to uh, uh, be, uh, they're supposed to be reporting back. Uh, I don't have any information for you at this time. Certainly, I will touch base with the team uh, and see if there's anything that we can share with all of you. Uh, but again, as we just saw yesterday with the 60th anniversary on the March in Washington, you saw the president bring the civil rights leaders. Uh, he talked about what happened in Jacksonville and that uh, a hate crime uh, happening uh, in, in that community. Uh, he has been very clear. It is time that all of us step in and do something and really uh, deal with an issue that's affecting uh, affecting all of our communities across the country. Okay. Thanks, Corrine. Uh, the president, while he was in uh, Lake Tahoe, said that he was not interested in dividing the FEMA supplemental assistance from the Ukraine supplemental assistance and, and, and the for, foreign aid piece of the puzzle. What would he do if Congress were to present him with a disaster only supplement? So look, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals from here. The president has made it very clear what he is asking from Congress as it relates to the supplemental ask uh, that he's uh, that he is uh, asking Congress of for Ukraine. Let, let's not forget that has been a bipartisan process, and he appreciates the bipartisanship that we have seen over the last two years to make sure that uh, to make sure that you, the brave people in Ukraine who is fighting for their freedom item for their democracy gets the assistance, uh, not just from the U.S., but from our partners and allies. That is something that uh, we are looking forward towards and are going to work towards. As it relates uh, uh, to FEMA, the, the uh, FEMA administrator just laid out uh, what's ahead 
and why uh, the, the $12 billion was asked. Uh, clearly, we are in a different period, right? As we look at climate change, as we look at extreme weather, as we look at what we've been dealing with, now we're stepping into hurricane season. All of these things are incredibly important. I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals of what, what the Congress might present, will present. Our administration, including the OMB director as well as the Ledge Affairs Office, has been in constant communication uh, with, um, uh, with, the, with congressional members. We're going to continue to have those conversations. Uh, again, this is what we have asked for is incredibly important, uh, and so we're going to continue to have those conversations. Yes, Marie. The White House announced, or you announced yesterday, that the President will mark 9 11 in Alaska on the way back from Vietnam. Uh, can you explain the decision, and does this reflect any kind of a new phase in how we want to memorialize that? And did you look at potentially going to Vietnam on the way there instead of the way back? So look, we'll, we'll have more on on 9/11 uh, on in Alaska, as you just as you just mentioned. I laid out and out announced that. Um, look, the president wanted to make sure that he, as the president, uh, did some did something to commemorate 9/11, uh, and that's what you're seeing. That's what you're seeing the president do. Uh, we'll certainly have more details to share. I just don't have anything more outside of that. Oh. Uh, thank you, Kareem. How is it possible that an ISIS sympathizer is sneaking people into this country? So just so that uh, folks, I'm assuming you're speaking to the CNN uh, story, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to make sure that uh, uh, folks who are watching understand the question. So I just want to be really clear here. So the intelligence alerted us to a human smuggling network. Uh, we moved fast uh, and, and successfully to, uh, to uh, successfully to disrupt it. So just want to be very clear of that. And we well, are being you disrupted it. Are you saying that you know where all of the people this ISIS sympathizer snuck into the country are? If I can answer the question, I'm sure I'll touch on every everything that you want to ask me. So again, in, intelligence alerted us of this human human uh, smuggling network. We believe and we move fastly and we successfully disrupted it. So let's be very clear about that. And we are grateful. We are very grateful to the law enforcement for their quick work and their vigilance on this. Now, to your other part of the question, smugglers have been detained overseas, including one link to the foreign terrorist uh, organization. Uh, no sign, there is no sign that any, anyone moved by the smuggling network has terrorism connections, so I want to be clear there as well. And what we were able to do as precaution, uh, people brought here by smuggling network are being subject to extra vetting and are all in removal proceeding. And in addition to that, in addition to that, anyone coming across the border outside of the network uh, who matches the profile of those in the smuggling network is subject to uh, extra vetting, detained, and put in expedited removal uh, proceedings as well. You said that there's no sign of a plot, but isn't it true that the U.S. has to be right with preventing terrorist attacks 100 percent of the time? They only have to be right once. So let's be very clear. I want to be really clear here. We are committed. This is, this is a White House that is committed to making sure that we are protecting our homeland and also protecting the American people. That is our commitment. We will continue to be vigilant on that. And so want to be uh, incredibly clear uh, on this. And, uh, and and we are thankful. We are grateful for our law enforcement who uh, who acted very quickly here. And they are disrupted. They, dis they successfully disrupted uh, the smuggling network. We've seen human smuggling networks operated by the cartels for years. Why the sudden urgency with this one? We always have, we have always and will be and have been vigilant here when it comes to making sure that we are protecting our homeland. That is something that this president is committed to. That is something that uh, this administration is committed to. We will always be and we will continue to be. Let's not forget uh, that uh, this was successfully disrupted uh, and it was because of the quick act of our law enforcement that we are incredibly grateful to. We have to go because the president's going to be starting his event in a couple minutes. Thanks everybody, I'll see you tomorrow.